So we, we have a lot of issues in the United States now uh, when it comes to uh, the, the sort of geopolitical uh, views. Yeah, let's talk about that. So you talked about in the Bronze Age uh, collapse, you talked about how these different nations uh, form type of living organism. And we sort of have, I couldn't help when I was uh, hearing you say that for the first time, I couldn't help but think about this multipolar Mexican standoff we have with uh, Russia, China, and the United States. Uh, we, we are trade partners, but something that surprised me is you said that we're, there were trade partners in the Bronze Age, uh, during the Bronze Age, and yet there was still wars. But uh, do you think China would actually um, ever invade Taiwan? Do you think uh, Russia would ever... Well, say Russia's a little different animal there that they probably, well, they might invade the Ukraine. But yeah, I couldn't help but think that we are forming a living organism nowadays with the amount of trade that we do with the rest of the world. So I think the, the analogy exists. What are your thoughts on uh, China's um, sort of military posturing lately with their hypersonic missile that goes across the, the planet proving that we don't have missiles capable of shooting it down and Russia and those aggressive stances and contrast that in the bronze age what you said where uh, we're going to continue i'm mad like to hear your thoughts on that no of course i mean the global supply chain is deeply interdependent the world's cpus are produced in only a few chip fabs mostly in taiwan mm -hmm. it actually takes a global market demand for hundreds of millions of chips to make the production of a, you know, in uh, operation of a modern chip fab economical. One of the basic realities is that I think the most efficient factory, like theoretically, theoretically, there should just be a single factory in the very best location, a truly awesome factory producing all of the world's cars. And that sounds sort of unusual until you think of the logic of mass production. One way to think about the Industrial Revolution is that it was an incredible centralization of production. Yes, of course, there was a lot of wealth distributed everywhere. But if you think about it, a thousand or 10,000 workshops again, uh, around England were placed with a few factories, followed by globalization, where those factories were shipped away into a single industrial region in modern day China. That's an intense centralization of production, right? And the reason is because of economies of scale and so on, and the deployment of all sorts of other resources and the pursuit of comparative advantage. The economy, the world's economy keeps wanting to be the same thing, but the economy sometimes outruns the social or political fundamentals that it rests on. Our system of international trade rests on a sort of international order and the absence of sort of these total wars uh, that could erupt otherwise between various parts of the world. If the US and China go to war with each other or stop trading with each other, uh, you know, the US might reindustrialize to a certain degree. But at the end of the day, I do think that they would actually be poorer because they're so deeply interdependent. Uh, you know, for better or worse, China does still benefit from American invasion, and the United States does benefit uh, from some amount of trade with the Western world. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, the United States does benefit with some amount of trade with East Asia. Um, what we could find, I think what we could find in a very serious war is that the damage inflicted would not just be measured in millions of lives as might happen with a nuclear conflict, but in decades or centuries of technological regression. I don't think anyone's proposed that in the aftermath of a war, it wouldn't be the end of mankind. It wouldn't be human extinction. However, all of these economies of scale that we've built up and specialized knowledge located in just a few locations would be wiped out. A serious nuclear war would wipe out the centers of knowledge, uh, most academic centers, most financial centers, many industrial areas. One could rebuild but while you are rebuilding, all the necessities of the industrial stack would become more expensive. We might find ourselves for a century or 50 years or 60 years with CPUs no better than those available in the 1980s because the only chip fabs we can hammer together 
are ones at the level of the 1980s, and our supply of these old pre-war chips would, uh, you know, slowly be deple depleted over time. We might find the price of energy skyrockets, or the rare earth metals needed for modern electronics, or say the very specialized equipment necessary to produce modern batteries is gone. And we might find that we are once again reliant on petroleum rather than these fledgling alternatives just at the time when, uh, you know, when we have already exhausted the fossil fuels that enabled the first industrial revolution. So I really wonder whether we get a do-over, right? We talked about the late Bronze Age collapse and their dependency on tin and copper. So when the trade routes supplying a region with tin and copper broke down, the use of bronze fell out, right? Bronze was no longer used. People had to regress to stone tools. The Assyrians were the exception because they managed to, uh, you know, develop iron weapons and so on. But we might face a similar regression if modern global interdependent civilization were to go and, uh, you know, undertake a truly catastrophic war. And, you know, none of this is said to trivialize the real tensions that exist between the United States and China and, you know, also Russia to a lesser extent, though I think Russia is still, despite everything, a declining power. So, you know, even though I think, you know, Putin is, is a quite strong statesman, Russia's hand, right, its, its fundamentals are not that good. It's, it's not the Soviet Union, no matter how much it might want to be, right? It's not a superpower. Mm -hmm.